Uh, and a very nice segue, actually, to Professor Guilfoyle's presentation on small states. So um, if you want to take to the podium, uh, Professor Guilfoyle. Th thank you very much, James. Um, I'd also like to begin by saying it's an honor to be here, and I'd very much like to thank both uh, the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korean Society of International Law for the invitation. Now, despite my being a lawyer, this presentation has uh, something of a political science flavor for which I can only apologize. Um, but if I say anything particularly provocative or outrageous, perhaps after lunch, that might help keep people awake. But in any event, um, compliance is, in a sense, as we've already heard, uh, where the law meets politics. And I won't belabor this point, as Larry's already covered it brilliantly, but we do have the question of what do we mean by compliance and how do we measure it? So is it the direct implementation of a tribunal's order precisely as ordered? Um, or could we view a case like the Arctic Sunrise as a question less of uh, soft non-compliance as soft compliance? Should we really be looking at the substantive behavior of states or more broadly how their behavior changes after a ruling? Or indeed, in a broader sense, is the test of effectiveness uh, what applicant states hope to achieve through litigation in the first place? That brings me to my particular interest in the question of small states versus great powers, or small states versus uh, sub substantially more powerful states. And this raises from a kind of political science perspective, why do small states litigate at all, particularly against, for example, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, when, as we've heard from Larry, we might expect that compliance might be less likely from great powers if they think core interests are challenged. So if power politics should always prevent compliance by great powers, the question is not why do great powers comply, but what do small states think they gain by invoking the law at all? So my interest is to understand how we can understand international litigation as what's sometimes called a weapon of the weak. So compliance in some of these cases, I'd contend, in the strict narrow sense, is not always the expected outcome. Uh, and that in fact, international dispute settlement or the use of legal argument in a broader political perspective opens up three key possibilities. The first is that you can challenge the legitimacy of an opponent's policy in not only before a court, but before, as it were, the court of world opinion. Uh, it's also potentially litigation, a vehicle for mobilizing support or multilateralizing a dispute and generating long-term pressure for legal or political change. Uh, so in this sense, I'm interested in dispute settlement procedures in a very broad sense, but I'll use litigation as a useful shorthand. Um, so obviously international law is the formal language of international relations and also has a legitimacy effect. States are more likely to accept that something is legitimate if it is legal. Therefore, ostensible compliance with international law is a requirement of being seen to be a legitimate member of the international community of states. So the significance then of litigation as a potential attack on legitimacy, I would contend, is seen in how great or greater powers react to losing cases or even having cases brought against them. So in the Philippines-China dispute that we've uh, already heard about from Larry, we can see a number of uh, occasions when China has reacted very strongly to the fact of the litigation, saying that the case was an attempt to circumvent jurisdiction and fabricate a basis for institutional arbitral proceedings, uh, and that the Philippines had cunningly packaged its case in order to bring it within jurisdiction. Uh, and the Chinese government, also through its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, said that the uh, case went to dispute settlement over issues where it had not consented and that while it would continue to abide by international law, it would work with directly affected states. It would work bilaterally to attempt to resolve the relevant disputes. And I'll come back to the significance of that framing in a moment. Um, but we also see uh, the Chinese Society of International Law in its well-known critical study of the case talked about a deliberate mischaracterization of the facts, that a broader dispute had been fragmented into component parts and then being camouflaged as 
disputes falling within the convention. Um, interestingly, uh, the report of the Chinese Society of International Law Council talked about mobilizing the academic community to cooperate with the overall deployment of diplomacy and to carry out the juridical struggle against an unjust ruling in cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not a use to which we normally see academic journals and societies put. Uh, we also see, though, some similar language in the Mauritius UK dispute between a, a very small state and a P5 state. Uh, that Dominic Grieve, the then UK Attorney General, um, characterised the case as having a real issue being about sovereignty and that this had been put forward in the guise of a case under UNCLOS and could not be such a case no matter how it was cast or recast. And similarly, a uh, UKFCO minister in um, the House of Commons highlighted that the case had been brought without the UK's consent and that this was best a matter to resolve bilaterally. And there are some similarities there in the, both the Chinese and UK framing of the proceedings and the problems with them that I'll come back to. So in the rest of my time, I want to look at uh, a few questions. The first is whether small state litigation against great or greater powers uh, in pursuit of their long-term goals should be considered uh, lawfare, it's a word that's often used in relation to such proceedings, or more sympathetically, strategic litigation, a term often associated with human rights uh, re human, regional human rights tribunals, or should we actually be thinking of it as a form of legal statecraft? And I'll come back to what I mean by that. There's also a question of long, short and long-term goals here uh, and the broader functions these proceedings may play. And that is really a question about how does law change politics, which is perhaps the general question about compliance in any event. There's the other question though, if this is to be thought of as legal statecraft, as a means of using your available instruments of power to achieve strategic objectives, what kind of arguments work? And here I want to take a sort of detailed look at just one case, uh, the Mauritius UK dispute as a case study, where I should acknowledge I had a, a small role in the legal team in the original UNCLOS arbitration. Um, and of course, it's not remotely daunting to be speaking about that case in front of so many people who participated in it or indeed uh, judged or arbitrated in it. All right, um, this all for me forms part of a, a present project that I won't speak about in great detail, uh, but where I am over four years looking for the Australian Research Council at a series of case studies uh, and also engaging a PhD student to consider uh, how climate change might fit into UNCLOS dispute settlement. And the reason for, if one's interested in small state and great power disputes, looking at the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, I think is obvious to everyone here. It has over 160 state parties and a compulsory dispute settlement system, which makes it a very attractive forum for smaller states. All right, so the first question is, how should we, as a matter of theory, as lawyers, characterize what goes on in these cases? Should we be talking about small state lawfare, small state strategic litigation, or legal statecraft. Um, so again, I come back to this central question. If from a political science perspective, formal equality, or indeed a critical legal studies perspective, formal equality has no leveling effect, why would small states resort to litigation and what do they hope to achieve? Interestingly, it's very common in legal literature to accept that non-state actors may use litigation as a weapon of the weak and to refer to it as lawfare or strategic litigation. There's been less focus on the question about whether small states might engage in lawfare or strategic litigation. So this brings me back to my question of terminology. But very briefly, uh, lawfare has, um, it's a relatively recent term. It was popularized by Charlie Dunlap as meaning the use of law to achieve an operational objective. Uh, other literature has pointed to lawfare as having a capacity to delegitimize one's opponent, an idea I've touched on. Um, Kittree wrote the most influential book in 2016, where he distinguished between what he called lawfare on the battlefield and instrumental law serving longer term, broader objectives. And instrumental lawfare involves creating and enforcing legal obligations that advance policy objectives, which might otherwise require military means in his conception. Um, recently, uh, Kai in his interesting book on China and uh, international law 
has identified law fair as having three dimensions, that it operates on the question of community and individual interest. Can you frame your interest through legal argument as being that of the international community and your opponent as having only individual interests? Can you frame the dispute as being about law or about politics? Can you try and argue that this isn't a legal dispute by shifting it into the realm of politics? And he also talks about good and bad faith, but for me that collapses back into the law politics distinction uh, for reasons I won't go into now. But really that first limb, community and individual interest, is about using law to mobilise a supportive constituency behind you. And that law and politics distinction I think goes to the question of legitimacy. All right, uh, we could then turn to what lessons we might learn for the law of the sea from strategic human rights litigation. And there are difficult questions to ask about strategic litigation, including what makes it strategic? Is it a question of who is litigating, how litigation is used, a question of methods, or what difference it makes at the end of the day? Um, and a lot of the literature in this space essentially says that strategic litigation seeks a long-term legacy impact, that it's a tool of legal and social change, and that it might encompass a variety of proceedings into a single campaign. Uh, and I'll skip that point. So one of the difficulties that Mike Becker has pointed out about this uh, literature, and I'm grateful to him for this quote, is that the difficulty with the lawfare and strategic litigation literature is it has a lot of difficulty in showing where these supposedly distinct practices end and where the rest of the practice of international law begins. So my aim is to ask, instead of what the, why these things are exceptional, what they tell us instead about the ordinary practice of law. Uh, and law is, among other things, a tool to achieve policy objectives. And I think as lawyers, we'd all agree with that. So the notion I'd like to introduce is the idea of um, legal statecraft. So the, the common theme in all of this literature is that legal instruments can be used in pursuit of policy goals or strategic ends. And normally, the use by a state of available instruments of power to pursue its policy goals is called statecraft. So it makes more sense to me to speak of litigation as a legal instrument of statecraft, at least in some contexts, rather than to speak of lawfare or strategic litigation, that this is something that foreign ministries are ordinarily engaged in. Uh, and there is, of course, a risk that we only speak of lawfare or strategic litigation when it is done to us. We engage in statecraft, you engage in lawfare or strategic litigation. All right, there are obviously risks in taking this more, perhaps, political science approach to litigation. So the obvious one that lawyers will raise is, could it legitimate political abuses of international law? Well, the first, uh, you know, as long ago as Lauterpacht, we've been reminded that the state is a political institution. A state can only have motives that are political, and all its disputes, if they go to an interest of the state, are, in a sense, political disputes. The law-politics boundary is not an easy one to enforce. And really, I'm not saying anything prescriptive. I'm just trying to describe the world as it works. States already engage in long-term campaigns to use or change international rules for their national advantage. Um, law is indeed useful as a tool of statecraft precisely because it has normative limitations. And lawyers can generally tell plausible arguments from bad ones. The fact that a legal argument can be made does not mean anyone will be persuaded by it. But it is true that a persistence of bad legal argument can potentially undermine any system of international law. I'm not here to advocate for or against legal statecraft. I'm simply attempting to understand the world as it works. This leads us to the question of how law changes politics. Uh, so it's been observed for a, a long time. Indeed, uh, Mark Weston Janus observed of the uh, US-Iran um, cases that, I, uh, that the ICJ procedures may be used to translate a specific bilateral dispute to one between the respondent and the international community generally. Uh, as Benedict Kingsbury has put it, weaker states rely on the prospect that court processes and eventual decisions will help motivate other major states to put pressure on respondent states to maintain the rules govern system and respect for its institutions. So political scientists, and particularly constructivists, would say that, as I've already highlighted, acting lawfully is a determinant of legitimacy, being seen to act unlawfully 
may compromise a state's position in the international order and at the very least its soft power. So the aim of small state litigation could be seen to be to change the legal facts of a dispute, to inflict a legitimacy penalty, to multilateralize the dispute and mobilize diplomatic pressure. In essence, the aim is to produce real change in how the world works, to put a thumb on the scale. Now, how might that play out in our case studies? What arguments actually get made in real life? So if we look at uh, the well-known um, series of cases brought by Mauritius, we can ask, how has legal statecraft played out in this context? Yep. The, the facts, uh, in essence, were that the pre-independence uh, Mauritian government was coerced into accepting the excision of the Chagos Archipelago in 1965 as part of the price of independence, and that archipelago was then became a US airbase under a sovereign lease from the United Kingdom. So we've seen a series of proceedings in relation to those facts, both uh, who is sovereign over the archipelago and who has the rights to manage the adjacent waters. So we've had the UNCLOS arbitration of 2010 to 2015, which led uh, in turn to the ICJ advisory opinion in 2018. And we've seen those issues agitated again in the Mauritius Maldives um, maritime delimitation dispute. We've also seen increasing institutional recognition of uh, Mauritian title to the Chagos Archipelago uh, in terms of changes to the world map, changes at the FAO, uh, measures taken at the International Postal Union, um, and recently a Mauritian delegation has visited the island and raised its flags. In an interesting sort of sidebar in the commercial sphere, the popular IO top level domain name uh, is associated with uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory, founded on these islands, and the, who owns that domain name is being challenged, as I understand it, in US courts. So there's a question of, as it were, not just the maritime zones, but the cyberspace zones that extend from this territory. Um, there is always a question in this type of litigation as to what gets pushed out of the picture, and it's certainly at least arguable that the population displaced from these islands, the Chugossians, have um, played a more symbolic, uh, perhaps, than substantive role in these proceedings. And the end game for Mauritius is really with whom eventually must the United States renew the airbase lease in light uh, of these various decisions. Now, if we turn back to the question of how have arguments been made in this case, what's interesting about Kai's um, two axes of individual interest and community interest and legal and political disputes is if we sort of map them onto each other, we can come up with something of a taxonomy. If you're an applicant state, the greatest advantage is to be secured by making arguments that this is a legal dispute that involves community interests. It is not purely bilateral. Conversely, as a respondent, you are pushed to making arguments that the dispute is in some sense purely political or at least non-justiciable and that it's purely bilateral, that no one else should take an interest in this dispute. There are other possibilities at well that I won't um, discuss for present purposes, uh, but one could see in sort of quadrant three perhaps some of the arguments of uh, nuclear weapons holding states and various ICJ proceedings conceding that the underlying issue is important but somehow fundamentally non-justiciable. So Mauritius opened proceedings in the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, in 2013 by noting that there was not a single African state that had recognized the lawfulness of what the UK had done and that the African position had been endorsed by the broader international community and drew attention to a colonial status quo. So he invoking uh, not only the law of uh, the sea and the law of decolonization, but these markers that this was a case of concern to a broader international constituency. So stressing that the dispute had a character going beyond the purely bilateral. Whereas conversely, uh, I've already highlighted the quote from Attorney General Greaves previously. Uh, Attorney General Greaves' comments can be seen through the, uh, the matrix I put up before as underlying that the case was not one within UNCLOS. So it was to the extent that it was legal at all, it was non-justiciable in this forum, 
and that this was purely a bilateral dispute, so moving very much to that fourth quadrant where you try to minimise the dispute and contain it. Um, obviously, as we all know, uh, the continued UK administration of um, the Chagos Archipelago uh, was ruled to be unlawful in the course of the Mauritius advisory opinion, and the ICJ held that the United Kingdom had an obligation to bring to an end its administration of the Chagos Archipelago as rapidly as possible, and that all member states must cooperate with the United Nations to complete the decolonisation of Mauritius. So that was a substantial um, victory for Mauritius. Uh, and, but interestingly, again, we see the kind of arguments that we'd expect based on Kai's framework in terms of statements such as the Council for the African Union, saying in the last few days it was clear that the overwhelming majority of states are in favour of the court to exercise its jurisdiction. An overwhelming majority supported the fact that the decolonisation of Chagos is incomplete. Not a single state argued or opposed the legal principles of decolonisation and self-determination. Those two principles are applicable to Chagos. So again, stressing the multilateral character of the issues um, under consideration. Uh, However, for quite some time, the position of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office has been to say in pretty much exactly the same language, we have no doubt about our sovereignty over the archipelago, which has been under continuous British sovereignty since 1814. Mauritius has never held sovereignty and we do not recognise its claim. Um, so again, the framing here is that it is a non-justiciable bilateral sovereignty dispute and the UK's position was to stress the advisory nature of the decision and therefore its uh, strictly non-binding character. So is all of this an example of legal statecraft in the kind of framework I've been outlining? Uh, and if it is legal statecraft, has Mauritius as a smaller state achieved its goals? Um, certainly over time there has been a delegitimization of the UK's position and a blow to UK soft power. Uh, has there been a change in the political climate engendered by these cases? Well, the vote to refer the advisory opinion to the court had 94 votes in favour. Uh, the vote um, endorsing the conclusion that the UK was under an obligation to end its occupation of the archipelago had 116 votes in favour. Uh, so we can see a significant and very many fewer uh, abstaining states. So we can see a distinct shift in the political climate over time. Also through things like the UN map, uh, the recognition of the International Postal Union, disputes over the IO domain name, we can see that in a series of legal proceedings, Mauritius has succeeded essentially in shearing away a number of the attributes of sovereignty that are meant to follow from sovereignty over land, including even in cyberspace. And recently it has been announced that the UK has agreed to negotiate with Mauritius over the final status of the Chagos Archipelago. Um, so whether we think this is a good or bad use of UNCLOS dispute settlement proceedings, we can see that over time, what began in an UNCLOS proceeding has formed part of an effective uh, campaign on Mauritius's part. Um, so there are a number of questions that one might have about my sort of approach and methodology. Um, one question is, what is a small state? Uh, and I won't go through this in any particular detail. Um, the one thing I will simply say is that at the bottom, at the end of the day, I think it makes sense to think of small states in relational terms um, when facing a significant asymmetry of power. Uh, also, um, an interesting point in all of these proceedings is to consider, uh, and I put this up with some trepidation given the number of people on this slide in the room, uh, but it is actually a very small um, community of people who are involved in these cases. If we look at that sort of top um, row of uh, judges and arbitrators, and then the lower two rows of um, principal counsel for applicants and respondents, and I've highlighted there the various um, repeat players. So this may be a good thing for the stability of the system, or uh, it might be a sign that perhaps we need a wider group of specialists involved, but it's nonetheless um, an interesting point to reflect on. Uh, but with that, I note that uh, my time is at an end, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to both of the speakers for their excellent timekeeping.